life. Oh, you're right. There we yeah. are. Finally. Okay. <laughs> happy Wednesday, everyone. <laughs> so happy and privileged today to have with me someone I really look up to and uh, respect and like a lot. Uh, so I have with me Moni Omotoso, who is the founder of Patent Catifica's Attracted. And, uh, oops, one second. Thinking, oh, Facebook hasn't gone live, yes. So I have, Moni, I have Moni Omotoso with me, who is the founder of Patent Catifica's Attracted. Uh, and she's an incredible lady with incredible experience and uh, super multi-passionate and multi-skilled. Thank you. Uh, I've been really looking forward to this conversation because there's like so much we can talk about. We'll probably mm -hmm. have to, like zero in on things. But so, Moni, welcome to our show. And thank I'll, you. I'll ask you just to start by introducing yourself. Uh, you know, probably do a better job than me and tell yeah. us what your, what's your involvement with the industry right now. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. And Desi, thanks for having me. Um, well, my involvement in the industry, where do I begin? At the moment, I'm a creative pattern cutter. I also have a business, Pattern Cutting Deconstructed, uh, which teaches the skill of Pattern Cutting Deconstructed to students or um, home dressmakers, basically anybody who wants to improve on their skills um, to pattern cutting or to learn a new skill. My creative pattern cutting um, journey has seen me working with uh, various companies within the industry. And I, I do ladies wear um, accessories and um, I've done some men's wear, but my main um, forte is ladies wear and accessories. I, of late, was working um, at Alexander McQueen as a creative pattern cutter, where I, um, I utilized a skill that I had only ever sort of done at university when I was at Middlesex, we draped on the stand. That's how we were taught to pattern cut and I absolutely loved it. But I was so impatient when I was young that I wanted to do flat pattern cutting because it was faster. Uh, draping was too labor intensive as far as I was concerned. But uh, sort of revisiting that um, at McQueen was amazing. And it all just came back to me after a, a quick recce on a YouTube video just to <laughs> reacquaint myself with the techniques. So I, I went in and had my trial and yeah, it was, it was brilliant, really great experience. Um, yeah. <laughs> But so I want to touch on the fact that you had a brand a long time ago. Mm. Uh, well, where was it? Just before the year 2000, no? In the 1990s? Yeah, yeah, in the late 90s. So well, I'm in my final year at uni. I designed a product called a jack sack, which was like a, based on military, because I I was and still am obsessed with military garments. Um, it was based on a parachute waistcoat with an attached backpack. Mm. And um, I made a couple of samples and sold sold it to Paul Smith, um, to Duffer St. George, you may remember from, from a long time ago, yeah, and uh, Jones, a, quite a famous shop at the time on Kings Road, um, and then in Covent Garden. So I, um, I was given some fabric, uh, curtain fabric, upholstery fabric by Paul Smith, and um, made all of these, I think I got an order of about 150, and I made every single one on my mum's singer domestic machine because I was just so excited and so happy to have got an order for, from a store of such high caliber um, and then the find the money I made from that that helped me with my final collection and then it then led me to um, set up my first label straight out of uni um, which was a women's wear range um, I acquired a couple of Japanese agents who sold for me um, in Japan um, and sold to some really good shops over here I had a an agent, a friend I'd met, um, well, at partying, who then sold the range for me. And then for PR, we would basically just write press releases, send them out and just knock on doors and take the collection around or have a little show, a little um, showroom and invite yeah. people. And most of the time they come. You know, not, it, was, it was easy. I was it, about to say so, sounds so simple and easy. Right. You know, it sounds straightforward, but I'm just sort of thinking about the golden times, probably. It was major hard work. I did all the pattern cutting myself. I did the designing myself. And then I would use a factory to produce samples after I tested them, after I twirled things. Um, I'd have samples made and then they do my production. Mm -hmm. But then I would sometimes have major problems with the factories in terms of like getting 
stuff done correctly. So yeah. sometimes things had to be redone. And I only ever had um, product made in, in England, in London, because we had a thriving industry um, back in the day and it was possible to get things done here. Mm. Uh, all my jersey was made up in Leicester and then all my um, non-stretch, all my wovens were made in, um, in East London by a tailor called <laughs> the Warhol. So how have things changed now? Because you say that you look back on this as the golden time and the industry, manufacturing industry was thriving then. How, how has it changed for now compared? Um, well, I haven't had a, a brand for a little while now. Um, but my, the last, my last foray into designing and production was with a handbag range that I was working on um, about three years ago. And I think that well, that's a different thing, I suppose, because I had problems finding a manufacturer and that's why I, it didn't really go anywhere. The product was quite labor intensive, so. We have, you have a sample, right? I do, yeah, I've got some samples here. So they're basically Italian quilted products. Um, and then all of this detailing on the, yeah. the bags is made by hand with um, rubber tubing. Yeah. On a canvas base with glove leather, which stretches and gives the, the shapes and things. And so I had I had made these all myself, all the samples, just to test to see that it could be done. And I proved that it could be done, but not necessarily in a factory setting. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying that it's difficult to get things produced. It also depends on the product. If they're maybe quite labor intensive or a bit too unusual, it's quite difficult to, to get things right. And I nearly got a deal with a, a company um, that Carmen Busquet of Netta Porter introduced me to, um, a licensing deal, and that fell apart because they couldn't even source a manufacturer in Portugal. So it was something I had to say goodbye to, but yeah, that's life sometimes. But in regards to what's happening in fashion, when you, with manufacturing, was that your, was that your yeah. question? What's yeah. happening with manufacturing? Well, the world is your oyster, or was uh, pre-COVID, we could, um, get products made in China quite cheaply, providing you wanted to produce in scale. You could find a company in Portugal, you could find places in Italy. But I think what's, but then what happened in China is that production became quite expensive yeah. because it, that would be the natural occurrence. Um, and then England sort of had a rethink about things and then we started to try and bring manufacturing back um, on shore um, and that, I guess is going to be will create more of an impact now with COVID because we need to get product done here. Leaving the EU as well is going to have will have a dramatic effect on that. So I guess in a way, it's is it easier? It will get easier, I think. I mean, back in the day, you could um, use outworkers to create your products, and I use it. I did this uh, quite a few times as well, where you would maybe have the products cut somewhere and then they'd be sent to at workers who would then machine them at home, home workers. And then I guess in terms of like uh, checking for finish and that would be something that the designer would do. And then you would pack them and then send them out to, to, the, to the shops. So it's almost like a cottage industry way of doing it. I think now that we, we've got niche brands producing smaller, maybe more um, artisanal products, it's possible to do that sort of thing again again yeah. yeah yeah but in terms of launching a brand and growing a brand what the you know is it the mindset today versus the 1990s or is the mindset the same <sighs> i don't no, know that is the mindset, you know i'm just thinking that um we just before we started you and i were talking about how somehow it was easier to launch a brand in the 1990s. And yet we have so many more tools and so many more, you yeah. know, software, help, you know, possibilities, yeah. opportunities. And yet it seems like it's harder now than in the 1990s, no? Um, I, because as I said, uh, when we were chatting before this, I, I didn't really feel it was really difficult in the 90s because I was fresh out of uni. And at that age, you anything is possible. You believe in yourself. You have uh, a, a bit of an ego, obviously. You um, have had a little bit of success with something, and it really spurs you on. And I'm a real doer as well. I do make things happen, and I like that about myself. And I think that's why I've always done what I've done, because I like the idea of having nothing and having to make things happen. That's just my personality. So in regards to maybe a door hasn't opened, that 
particular person in the uh, magazine hasn't got back to you, you find another way to approach them. So it's being tenacious. It's also having a bit of skill and a bit of talent and just going out and doing it. Whereas now, what I would say, it just seems like everybody calls themselves a designer and it seems like there's they're more people, they're more designers. I think you have superstars, for example, who turn their hands to design. It's like, oh yeah, I'm a designer now. And they've had no training. But it, it's almost like a styling project to them, but they have the, the headline of top designer. Uh, uh, there's so much rubbish out there, is what I'm saying. And I think what would be really nice after COVID is over, or once it's transformed the way we sort of approach fashion and work, is that it sort of sorts the wheat from the chafe, as they say. We'll get back to something that is really worth the money or that's really unusual. I think it's really important to be very different, to have a point of difference. Yeah. Because it's easy to design a T-shirt that is like the next T-shirt. Yeah. I always want to see something really special and a bit different, and that's what really inspires me. Yeah, I, I, um, just, I just think the social media and you know technology allowed anyone to become a designer or to launch a brand. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of escalated the product, the, the process, and everyone just wants to, you know, run before they can walk. They want to launch it without thinking about it, doing market research. And that's why we have so much of the same stuff, right? Yeah. So, I didn't do any market research when I was that age, when I first started my brand. I don't but, but I think there was less people wanting to enter the industry because they thought at the time they had to, you know, have gone through college. The internet hadn't given them that, you know, possibility or belief that they can, they can do it. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Yeah, all you need is now a website, right? And then you know you don't have to be a designer. You can just buy something, build a website, put some Facebook money, advertising, whatever, and so right. Yes. Yeah, that's true. So um, when that didn't exist, people felt like they had to study to become a designer. There was less, you know, people entering the industry. Now it's just too much. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said for learning your craft, but it also depends on what level you want to enter the industry at. If you couldn't just become a pattern cutter without learning some techniques, you could do design with it. I don't necessarily think you can be taught how to design, though, I have to say. I think you've either got the, you either have that or you don't. I think in terms of like formulating collections and working out how many items need to be within that range, that's something that can be taught. Marketing yeah. can be taught, pattern cutting can be taught, but in terms of like the, the 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 basic skill of design is something you either have or you haven't, in yeah. my opinion. Hmm. Yeah. So what are you doing now? You, you the skill of pattern cutting which you developed through your various ventures and brands and teaching because you, you were teaching as well, they sort of culminated and led you to launch something very unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. so I, was, I did a teaching degree in 2012 um, and then started teaching at um, Royal College of Art, uh, Central St. Martins, um, London College of Fashion and Morley College. And um, yeah, I taught various uh, different types of workshops and things, done various lectures, given various lectures as well. But throughout that time, I wanted to sort of do something. So basically, let's say, let me say, I set up Pattern Cutting Deconstructed in 2017, and it was basically a platform to just uh, show people how to pattern cut and to show my skills and to get freelance work as well. So a plat an educational platform, but also for, for, for acquiring work. And then I did a, I shot a video of, um, I did a focus on thing, which is I like to break down pattern cutting because I think teaching it in its entirety is really difficult for somebody who doesn't know what it's about. So my favorite designer is um, Charles James. So I found some beautiful images of the garments that inspired me. And I focused on a particular technique on that particular garment and then created a little series on, on Instagram called PCD Focus On, which would then show the garment with an arrow pointing to the technique and then I do a mini speedy video and my following just went a bit crazy and um, it was while I was doing that sort of thing I just thought how can I teach pattern cutting in a simplified interesting but dynamic way <laughs> and I started thinking about a kit because I looked at the industry in terms of like uh, the dressmaking industry and there are lots of indie pattern cutters pattern sorry indie uh, pattern makers so you, you buy all patterns and you make your garments up 
which I love, which is great. And I taught myself to, to sew by watching my mum and also using patterns when I was a kid. So um, I understand the importance of them, but I didn't want to do a pattern. I wanted to do a kit that could help you teach, could teach you pattern cutting. And pattern cutting is really difficult to learn. It's not something you can just pick a book up and just say, yeah, I've got it. You need some sort of understanding of the three-dimensional form. You need some understanding of maths. <laughs> she says, I was such a bad math student when I was at school and pattern cutting really helped me. So um, so the kit basically teaches you the skills of pattern cutting. It's um, the three different levels, beginners, intermediates, and um, confident amongst you. And the kit originally was one kit with these three levels within it. I've since split it into three kits as well. So, um, and then I've also got a pack which has an add-on for different types of sleeves. Um, and I'll, I'll show it to you here. This is so cut and spread pattern making kit. And then those are the six items. The two, where are we? Two for beginners, two yeah. for intermediates, and then two for confident, which is that they're two draped items. Mm -hmm. So it comes with full instructions and um, a block for you to trace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it also comes with ama this amazing paper that I discovered while I was developing the kit called Pactic. And it's, um, I found it because I was interviewing a, a brand who use it for their, um, for their product, for their packaging. And I thought it would be really good to use for the kit, but it didn't work for the whole kit. Um, but it's, it's, it's sewable. You can use it to trace your patterns, create your patterns, and you can also stitch it as well. Oh, really? So yeah, it's amazing. And create your first prototype basically from the patent. From the paper, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, in addition to that, I've also got calico in the pack as well. And then a half scale block, which allows you to sort of just play around and test it out before you get onto the real thing because it can be quite intimidating, I think, just sort of like launching. Um, it's got full instructions for all the levels. And. I've got a couple of videos on YouTube which um, demo how to how to use the kit as well. That's amazing. So was it? I mean, it's very different from you know making a product, is that sketching something and designing it, right? So was it daunting to develop that new idea and go into something completely different? Um, it was. It took about two years to sort of get off the ground because I worked with a friend of mine, graphic designer. Who didn't who didn't want to charge me <laughs> so he did all the graphics and it was also a learning curve for me in terms of like how to approach it so there were lots of changes um in regards to sort of getting the designs in the first instance they started off as something quite different to what they to how they are now i didn't mind that it was just a, a case of trying to get the um to try and get as many sort of like uh learning outcomes within the pack as possible yeah. so that you can see progress as you work through the beginners through to the confident um, because it is an aid to, to learning. Um, but off the back of that kit, I've been um, collaborating with the V&A and I created a, a kit for them. Uh, is it for, last the kimono, year? for the kimono exhibition. That's the latest thing. But initially I did um, something else for Creative Quarter, which is a, a, a something they do every year to, to inspire um, school children. So I gave a, a lecture to show them how to show the students how they could um, use this kit to develop their pattern cutting skills in dressmaking classes. Mm -hmm. um, but the latest thing is, yeah, kimono. I did, uh, which is obviously not on at the moment, is it? Such a shame. Um, eventually. Sorry. We will open eventually, right? We will absolutely. So the, the it was a two part um, collaboration with the VNA. The first. Um, was to work with my old university, Middlesex Uni, and um, to, to have a lecture with the, a couple of lectures with students to use a kit that I developed for kimono to inspire them to create something that's based on the kit and the exhibition. And then I was um, introduced to the head of uh, uh, learning at the VNA. He asked me to develop a, a dressmaking pattern as a free download for the VNA with four different sleeves based on my love of origami and that's going to be launched in july and i'm really excited about about that it's um it's looking amazing so um yeah opportunity how did that come about then because often people think that oh you must have known someone or how did yeah, i was introduced to someone 
Okay, so it's yeah, the next a case of that because it's it's almost impenetrable. Some of these institutions are impossible to to make any headway through unless someone introduces you. It's right. I hate it. It's just the way it goes because I had approached them about three years ago to to discuss a project that I was really interested in to do a pattern cutting and mm -hmm. didn't get anywhere with it. And then um, a friend of mine introduced me to the lovely Leanne at the V&A and um, the rest is history. And she's we get on brilliantly. She really likes what I do, and she's always introducing me to various departments in the at the institution. So is, it, is it the case that maybe you didn't have the right contact before? Or is it the case that you came recommended through a different source? What do you uh, think? I came recommended, then I suppose. Yeah, I'm. I'm, <laughs> I'm a bit modest. <laughs> yeah. No, was part of me was hoping you say no, you know, I approached them and they took me on, but I guess uh, no. it doesn't always work like that. I can imagine that they're inundated with um, various, with, with lots of people approaching them. So I guess it's a case of, well, I don't know you from Adam, so, which is a shame, but yeah. the world is big. It's, um, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how are you managing to market this? Because now that you've got the product, the physical product to sell, you need mm -hmm. to turn on your marketing head on, right? Mm, yeah, okay. So how's that going? How does it happen? I, when I launched it in September last year, I, uh, only, I only sell them on my website at the moment. The plan was this year to try and start wholesaling them, which I will eventually do, but just the, it's not the right time. Yeah. Um, so the way I've been sort of, I thought I could just sort of advertise it a bit on Instagram and because people liked my videos, I thought that my followers would basically translate into customers. Like I've got 50,000 followers now. And when I launched, I had, I think, um, uh, I can't remember, maybe 35. And I thought that if I have 5% conversion, that'd be amazing. And it doesn't ever work like that. And um, I had a meeting with a guy who sort of advises uh, brands about marketing and stuff. And he was saying, what you need to do is people don't really buy stuff if you just put a product online and you do a little video. You basically need to make them want to learn pattern cutting by showing demonstrations and videos, giving away a lot of free product. And then you, you direct them to this kit, which will do everything that you've spoken about. And it makes perfect sense. Um, so I've been working on that, but I've also, by working with the V&A as well, that's helped. I mean, when I think about it, if I hadn't done the kit, I wouldn't have got any of that work with the V&A. So the sales will eventually come, but it's almost in, irrelevant in a way because it's led to so many other things because it's almost a, a proof of what I'm capable. This is capable of doing. This is what I can do. This is what I'm so passionate about. This is what I really want to do for my future. And they could see that. And it was a case of how can we make this work within various departments? Um, so it's it's been the best thing I've done. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's the right time for me as well. I don't want to be a designer. I don't really have that. I have passion for other things, but not to prove myself as a designer. I designed for educational purposes. That's what I want to do. It's about showing what I've learned over, I'm not saying how many years, but over a few years, what I've learned and then putting it out there and saying, and also taking on board younger people who have so much skill yeah. as well and so much to, to give. I'm so open to, to all of that too. Well, so, you've done um, a bit. I mean, you did that years back, right? Being a designer. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, I'm still designing, but it's not the same type yeah. of time. It's Have different. you noticed a swing in the, you know, in, in your customers or in general, in people towards more wanting to learn how to sew because of perhaps finances having changed or, um, or this period of time getting people at home? I think what's happened with the dressmaking industry is that it's almost a backlash to fast fashion that um, you can buy really cheap clothes really easily, but everybody looks the same. I think um, the dressmaking industry has always been thriving, yeah. but there has been a resurgence in um, in the industry with people because of indie pattern cutters. There's so many independent pattern makers out there who are creating things that are niche and it's mm -hmm. about doing things that talk to your specific audience segment. Um, so I don't know if it's anything to do with 
it's, it's got something to do with COVID. Of course it has. People are at home, they've been furloughed, they want to learn a new skill. What is the thing that is going to help you in the future when this is over? Learning something, education, and this is the way forward as far as I can see. Everybody is jumping on board for, for online um, tutorials. Zoom has gone crazy, They're making so much more money than they were two months ago. We all understand why. It's, um, it's, a, it's a great place to be, I have to say. I said to my friend the other day, again, I'm so glad I don't have a label. I'm so glad I, I teach. I'm glad I do what I really am so passionate about. It seems like the right place at the right time. So. Yeah, I agree. I think that kind of sentiment will keep on. It will stay, stick around. Oh, yeah, I hope so. I don't want to go back to how it was before. <laughs> no, not at all. Just it's been quite nice of people to maybe slow down a bit and just sort of reassess what is my life about? What do I really want from this? It's not just about going to work nine to five and not really enjoying nature. Nature's replenishing because of COVID, for God's sake. How long will it take for that to happen? Hardly any time at all. Yeah. Step back and just reassess what you're doing in your life and try a new skill, try something else. It could lead to a new uh, career path. Yeah. And I think we all have accumulated over the years so much stuff in terms of clothes. Mm. If we were to learn, you know, how to sew or something, we can turn this into something new and yeah. extend it. I love the idea of using your old clothes and maybe unpicking things and using the fabric to produce something else. I very, very rarely buy clothes. I Everything in my wardrobe is made or I bought secondhand. But it doesn't stop there. I, I never wear things. Oh, the stuff I make, I think I wear straight away. But if I buy anything from a thrift store, I, there's always something that needs to be done to it. I'm never satisfied. But I keep doing that over time. I don't. I have thrown. Well, I have given things away, but I don't tend to throw things away. And I always find a use for them. Uh, yeah. I, and I'm really tall as well, so it's never that easy to just go in a shop and buy something. You're always customizing. Yeah, always. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's a trend, a new trend of more and more people learning how to do that, how to customize, how to make their own clothes because they want to make a statement through their purchasing behavior against yeah. the world. So I feel Absolutely. like it's very timely to do what you're doing, you know, teaching pattern cutting and, you know, mm -hmm. tapping into that sentiment currently. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't want to become a pattern cutter, learning their skills enables you to convert your clothes into pieces yeah. that you want to convert them to. So, yeah, it's, it's good on, on quite a few levels. So, yeah. yeah. So what's the future like for having getting the constructed? What are, you, what are your plans for? Oh, they're, they're secret at the moment. Okay. Uh, but there are some really nice plans. And because of lockdown, I've had the time to sort of really think about what I want to do with the platform. I also got a, a grant from the Arts Council, which is amazing. Thank you, Arts Council. So that's really helped um, me to sort of just take a look at what I've got. Because the plan at the beginning of this year was to work full time and yeah. then to run this on the side. But now things have changed. It's, Do you mean full time when you got the job with Alexander McQueen? Sorry? Do you mean full time, work full time when you got the job with Alexander yeah. McQueen? Yeah. I mean, that came around quite, um, that was a surprise job, actually, because yeah. I, I didn't apply for that specific job I applied to an agent who then put me forward for the job which I would never have applied for anyway because it was all about draping and as I said before I hadn't done draping for ages but it's creatively it was the best job but in terms of like full-time I don't want to work at that level full-time it was all consuming working weekends as well and mm, no it wasn't ideal um, in some respects so um, working full-time or oh, three times a week would, would have been the idea for this year and then to run pattern cut and deconstructed on the side um but as i said things have changed and i'm sort of reassessing what i've actually got and what i can do with this and i'm asking my audience a lot of questions um what their needs are etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's the main that's what, what i wanted to say about social media the ability to to directly chat to your audience is incredible yeah. That's something you would have killed for back in the day when I had my first label. To, because I remember when I sold my products to various shops and my main fear was that nobody's going to buy anything. Well, I know the buyers like them, but is, are the audience going to want it? And now you can speak directly to your audience and fine tune things and tweak things to suit them, almost providing a, a, a customizable product through direct chats with your, with your audience. Isn't that incredible? It is. Uh, 
I'm old. That's why I say I make it sound. Oh, it's amazing. The no, answer. No, no, I think it's just incredible that so quickly we can get a reading if something works or not. You know, and we can like that, that uh, space of idea to launch can be so much shorter. Absolutely, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, it can be a curse because it can be like too many ideas, you know, too many people listening to too many people. Yeah, no, that's true. But I think you, yeah, that's, I would totally agree with that. Because um, what I see is that in the past, I remember brands being a lot more niche and sticking to that niche for a while. Whereas now, maybe because there's so much noise, but mm -hmm. people want to launch straight away into a lifestyle brand with so many products to so many customers. They're not happy with having one idea of yeah. three, five, you know? Yeah. And More yeah. necessarily better. Yeah, and straight away compete with Topshop or someone who's been like for 30, 40 years. Yeah. Crazy. Well, yeah, but having said that, though, I do remember when I went to visit buyers and they would say, you are competing with those brands. If you're putting yourself on the, on the world stage, so to speak, and you're presenting a range and you want to sell in Selfridges or you want to sell in in Harrods you are placing yourself on the same level with those brands and that's how the buyers see you mm. uh, so that in a way is quite it's quite s scary it's almost I've got to compete with them so I have to be seen to be as big as them which is impossible when you're starting out unless you've got the funds um, funds of mum and dad or family inheritance or whatever I think niche is good. Sorry? Mom and dad have to be pretty rich. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. One of the, the worst industries to be in if you don't have any funding. <laughs> Why would you even start? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you can com compare and compete to an extent with these brands, but you don't have the same possibility. So you have to be different, which is what we were talking about earlier. You yeah. have to be different. You still compete with them but you have to be different and stand out and compete on a different level from them. In terms of like, I think in terms of marketing, for example, and your message, you can compete with them. Yeah. And in terms of like product, you produce one item in five iterations and then you can compete with them because you're, it's one product, which is an amazing product to start with, but you finish it in various ways in different um, fabrics and different finishes. And then you just build it slowly. Yeah, yeah I think that's where we're going. I'm really hoping that post this period, you know, some of the fast fashion, I don't think it will go away completely, but I think some of it will. Yeah, I think it can go away. And it's un you have to think about families who don't have much money. They have to clothe themselves and their children. There is a place in society for fast fashion, but... I don't really know what the answer is because it really frustrates me because I don't think we should, we should get rid of it. We can't because then what happens to our, our poorer communities? They, as I said, they have got to look after their families. There has to be another way to make it circular, but I don't I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, yeah I don't know what it is either. <laughs> we made. We wish if we did. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? We'd be rich if we knew what the answer was. Yeah. Well, yeah. the good thing is that it's changing, though. So that's um, yeah, definitely. definitely good. Okay. Well, before we finish, any parting advice? Someone who wants to launch a brand or do something different, monetize their skills in a different way. Uh, what would you? Because you know, yesterday I do this uh, daily talks at the moment on our Facebook page. Yesterday I was talking about how nobody tells you that you can't really earn a living from your brand alone. You have to do so yeah. many other different ways to bring in money into the brand. Yeah. And yes. that's what I love about you because you've started as a designer, you were passionate about pattern cutting, and that has led you into so many other different avenues. And right yes. now, you are, you know, you're getting money from so many different sources. It's not just your... It's not just my... my yeah. yeah, that's true. Although everything I do do is related to fashion. So I don't really diversify too much from my yes, main my thing. But, but writing, for example... Yeah, writing and freelance and collaborations. Um, yeah. hmm, maybe one-offs for various people. Yeah. You could have private clients. Yeah. Uh, but you understand, you understand the concept that you can't just have one thing that pays the bill and gives you okay. the money. And that's what's quite interesting about it, though, I think. It's, it's quite 
it, it can send you a bit stir crazy, I suppose. It's the it's the gig economy, isn't it? Yeah. That you do lots of different things. You're working on a desk and you've got this going on and that going on, and then that can lead to burnout. So I think it's a case of trying to focus on three things that can bring money in, no more than three, because you have to have a life as well. It's not just about killing yourself yeah. to make to make a buck. Um, although obviously you need to earn money to live. So it's a case of, I don't know, being creative with your skills. You're not only interested in one thing within your within your um, your passion. There are tentacles that lead to other areas that pique your interest, that make you, that inspire you to to want to do something else. So as long as they're sort of all related, and then it becomes this sort of like um, marketing tool for your brand because it shows that you are an expert in a particular area, but and you're also able to to wear a couple of hats as well. Yeah, that's very important. I think becoming uh, the key person of influence and I've, that's a, a phrase I've taken from the dent company yeah. um, and that's what it's about with niche brands it's like you become the person that everybody gravitates to because you know exactly what you're doing you're an authority so by having lots of different things three different things going on then that proves that but, but that means that you have to build up your personal brand as well and leverage that and play with the brand your business plus you as a brand and yeah, absolutely you personally as a brand which is something i hated the idea of years ago i was on dragon's den for a maternity wear range that i had and deborah mead it wasn't it was a terrible episode i was so nervous it was crazy anyway deborah meadon was lovely and she spoke to me she said oh you have to sell yourself as a brand money the brand and it just filled me with horror because i wasn't so confident about be sort of talking in front of an audience at that time. It's only been in the last four years or so that I feel quite confident about that. And that comes with age, I suppose. And I understand it now because I thought I could just hide behind my hands with my videos and that would be enough, but it's not. People want to see your face behind and the name and they want to interact with you. And, yeah. and yeah, absolutely. Not just to hands. So, yeah. Yeah, and again, going back to that point about being different, I think that your personality, who you are, it's the one certain thing that everyone's got that makes them different from everyone else. So it needs to be put to use. I lost a bit of that. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Um, you know, be, using building your the brand of you alongside your business is really yeah. important because that's the one certain way to be different from everyone else, even if they're doing similar things to you. Absolutely, yeah, because everyone's story is unique to them, isn't it? So yeah. that's what people are obsessed with, your backstory, your authenticity or yeah. not. So, yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Cool, okay. So where can people find you? Where can they purchase the kit if they wanted to or learn more? Okay, so my website is the name of my company, patterncuttingdeconstructed.com. Uh, follow me on Instagram at patterncuttingdeconstructed. I think I might have to shorten that name. And I'm, I'm on YouTube as well. I also do lives. I've got a live at five o'clock today, actually, on Instagram. Um, and that's it for the moment. I'll be on the V&A website once they're back on with, the, with my products there. So, um, yes, that's right. it for the moment. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful and insightful. Thank you for having me. No pleasure, and let's catch up again in a few months and see when the DNA is reopened and everything. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love that. Yeah, good luck. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. Mom. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>